Hello, everyone. Welcome to Teaching with Magic, a podcast exploring the intersection of education, fantasy, and literacy. Here at Teaching with Magic, we explore the different ways that teachers in the fiction and in the real world make magic for their students. You'll hear discussions about teachers and teaching methods in fantasy, science fiction, and pop culture. You'll hear interviews with scholars in various fields about important topics in education, and you'll get to be a part of an ongoing conversation about why the imagination matters. Welcome to Teaching with Magic. Hello, listeners. Thank you for joining us today. I am your host, Elise trudel Sedanio, and I'm joined today by Katie McDaniel and Emily Strand, the hosts of Potterversity, a Potter Studies podcast. Potterversity explores the Harry Potter universe from a critical academic perspective with scholars from a variety of fields, including but not limited to literary theory, psychology, sociology, gender studies, and so much more. In addition to hosting this wonderful podcast, they are also teachers in higher education, and they bring their love of fantasy, science fiction, and popular culture into their own classrooms. Katie is a professor of history at Marietta College in Marietta, Ohio, and Emily is an instructor in comparative religions and cultural competence at Mount Carmel College. Both are editors and writers of several Harry Potter essays and books, including Harry Potter for Nerds, Volume 2, Open at the Close, Literary Essays on Harry Potter, and other upcoming publications on Harry Potter, Star Wars, and Star Trek. Katie and Emily, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having us. It's so great to be here, Elise. Thank you. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting you both a couple of years ago at the Chestnut Hill Harry Potter Conference. Woohoo! So much fun. Love it. <laughs> so much fun. So starting off, um, let me just ask you, what subjects do you teach? And can you describe them for us for those who may be unfamiliar with your disciplines? Uh, Katie, how about you start? Well, I teach history. And this surprises people because when you're, you know, you have a podcast about novels, they don't really expect you to be a historian, uh, <laughs> but I'm an Anglophile. British history is my specialty and I love fiction and I particularly am interested in like intellectual and cultural history. And what I think I've sort of figured out is that I'm, I'm actually also really interested in intersections of pop culture and history, the way that pop culture uses historical ideas or, you know, the concept of time travel and those kinds of those kinds of things so that the history is always kind of creeping in. And uh, obviously, I see lots of opportunities to bring fantasy novels in because fantasy is often, you know, looking into the past and it's got something to say about the past in the present that I find really fascinating. That is fascinating. Thank you, Katie. Emily, how about you? Well, I am a religion uh, professor, really. That's always been my my jam. Um, and I've more recently gotten into courses on um, religious and cultural competency um, for uh, future healthcare professionals. Um, so my um, area of expertise is Catholicism and specifically Catholic liturgy and sacraments. Um, and I am actually also a liturgist, so I'm somebody who helps put on Catholic liturgy and sacraments. And so I'm um, on kind of more of the practical end of it. Um, but I have to say, I started out my undergraduate career at the University of Evansville in Indiana as a literature major. And um, my sophomore year, I switched to religious studies, but I never lost my love of literature. And I always say uh, uh, Harry Potter was out, but I, I wasn't aware of it yet um, at that time. But my real love back then was Arthurian legend and Shakespeare. So it's, it's all very related <laughs> to my love of Harry Potter. And so, um, so yeah, so, so, uh, and, you know, the things that I'm able to teach now uh, to future nurses, um, really, uh, I, I do find lots of, you know, everybody loves these fantasy franchises. It used to be that this was only stuff for nerds, but now there's a little, you know, a little slice of everybody likes this stuff. And so I do find that it's a it's a great way to relate to students and to to pull them into the subject a little, in, a, in a deeper, more experiential way. I love that. Uh, have you noticed that in, in the nursing that the, your nursing students have 
a different perspective when te- when taking these cultural competence classes and how that uh, comes out in your classroom? Like, is there something? Well, yeah, um, they're, I, I, with regard to cultural competence, they're intensely interested in this because they recognize that um, that the goal of it uh, is to make them better givers of care um, and to help them create a more uh, an environment that is conducive to healing. And th- and that's they're driven by that. They're very driven by that. And so so they have open ears. I, I once in a while I hear of somebody who wishes they didn't have to take it. But 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 usually throughout the course, they their eyes are kind of open and they say, oh, actually, I'm glad I did take this, you know. Um, so they're so they're very motivated. And I have to say, many of them do get into these um, sort of fantasy properties because nursing is so difficult and so demanding that they really need a release from it. Um, and they're very intense individuals. In fact, I often teach in our um, second degree accelerated program um, where people who already have a bachelor's degree come back for a 13 month program to get their uh, BN uh, degree, their, you know, to become registered nurses. And so they're intense people already, you know, if they signed up for this. Um, and so they tend to go all in with whatever they do. So, so many of them, uh, you know, will, will, you know, say to me, you know, I, I love this too. And I, I think this is so great. And what's your favorite character and who, what's your ho- Hogwarts house and things like that. So it's, it's a great way of connecting with them because I'm not a nurse. Um, I don't have a nursing degree, so so I can't connect with them on that level, but I can connect with them on a lot of other personal levels. Wow, that's incredible. And that's, that's so refreshing to hear that, you know, this is, that this does become a safe haven for someone who for someone in nursing who might need that deep breath, who might need that that open that open dialogue. Yeah. So um so which fantasy and pop culture stories do you both use in your teaching? Um, I know I talked about, uh, I mentioned Harry Potter um, and some of your other publications, but how do you bridge the gap uh, between the fictional content and your subject area? I know, Katie, you talked a bit about um, your Anglo your Anglo history and the your Anglo history subjects um, that you find in fantasy. Yeah, so, you know, I will say you get, uh, you get people in history class and they don't know why they have to read a novel for history, right? So, uh, but actually what I have my, I'm teaching 20th century Europe right now. And I have my students reading the novel, We, which is by Evgeny Zemyatin. And it's sort of the foundation text for 1984. Y'all know it. Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. Page Turner. George Orwell. I have a middle stuff. school student who wants to read it. And I'm like, maybe wait. A year or two, maybe. <laughs> yeah, there's some adult stuff in there. Yeah, there yeah. is. There is. <laughs> but yeah, but it's, you know, and I know, and I have students who are like, what am I supposed to be getting out of this? And it's like, I want you to feel what it feels like to live in this time. And he's writing 1920, 21, when the Bolsheviks, have, they've almost cemented their power. And it's very predictive about the kind of state, uh, the totalitarian system that's being created. And what he thinks its ultimate, you know, uh, you know, what it's actually going to end up looking like if we play it out years and years and years in advance. And, and what I like so much about speculative fiction um, is that it is an exercise in imagination where you, you can get outside of yourself and you're not just on the defensive, I think, as so many of us right now are just on the alert for the politics of any <laughs> given situation in terms of how it works with what we, you know, what our current situation is. And I like this kind of text because it it makes you get out of your own context and it puts you in this other literally realm where you can actually explore ideas without worrying about, you know, which part of the political spectrum am I? You can actually think a little bit more freely about them. And uh, and I like that in so many ways. I also, I did teach a Harry Potter class uh, as a freshman seminar. It was called Harry Potter and the Liberal Arts. And what I did was I sort of had students, I anticipated that they would have read the books or at least seen the movies before they came to the class because we didn't read the books in the class. We read scholarship about the books And I wanted people to see the value of the liberal arts, which is, 
you know, lifelong learning and you're going to understand yourself and you're going to understand the world and you're going to know a little bit more about people. And so we looked at psychological approaches and religious approaches and, you know, we read some, you know, Joseph Campbell, uh, Hero with a Thousand Faces and, uh, and looked at history and uh, science also. And what it does is it kind of, it was a, it served as a nexus for understanding all of these interesting ideas about the world that, you know, they could dabble in just by thinking about this one story. And so I think that's what I, what's, what I really like most about it. I'll occasionally also use um, little analogies, you know? So, I mean, basically Voldemort quotes Nietzsche at the end of the Sorcerer's Stone. There is no good and evil only power in those too weak to seek it. I don't know if that's exactly the line, but that's basically what Nietzsche said. <laughs> and so I always say, like Voldemort said, you know, when I'm trying to get them to have a sense of what Nietzsche was all about. And uh, I'll, I'll do that with a few things. I talk about the matrix is so good for, you know, that sense of uh, that we, you know, the real our reality is somewhere else. And if we could only really, uh, you know, understand that this is all a fiction and being created, we could stop bullets and stuff like that, like Keanu Reeves does. And uh, again, I think that somehow connecting with things that are popular, kind of what you were saying, Emily, you know, things that the students have this and they think it's just playing around. But I think the genius of it is that it's playing around, but in that serious way that, you know, when kids play around, you get this a pedagogy podcast, when kids are playing, they are learning. And when I think anybody is reading fantasy fiction, they are learning. And I think it's just a really core part of uh, kind of understanding us. Yeah, that's that's all so true. And um, I think uh, I thought I was just playing around with my love of Harry Potter, too, until uh, the seventh book came out and uh, somebody, my sister, my older sister made a passing comment um about she said gosh i i feel like i understand the the passion and um death of christ you know more having read this and hmm. you know and i was just like really <laughs> you know and then i kind of made me kind of look at it more deeply and and that's really how i got into harry potter studies as an academic discipline because i it was so near i thought i was just enjoying these books as a as a release you know um and uh, it turned out it was really near and dear to what I was studying and, and teaching even in my Catholicism courses. So I have to say Harry Potter and especially really all the books, but but especially Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows really have helped me so much over the years to teach both, you know, um, college students and adult learners about the Paschal Mystery of Christ, the Communion of Saints. I like to play that clip from Deathly Hallows. Um, when Harry is in the forest and he uses the resurrection stone to conjure the shades of his loved ones that have passed. And, and Lily says, and this does not happen in the book, but in the film, he says, um, why are you here? And she says, we never left. And, and that's just like such a great yeah. way to help my students understand when Catholics say the communion of saints, this is what we mean, that you're yeah. constantly surrounded by a cloud of witness and that there is no death among friends in Christ, you know, that, that we are all, we never left. We're always here cheering you on, you know, mm -hmm. um, even, even after you're gone. And so the role of sacrifice, you know, cause some people think of sac sacrifice in Christianity and it's very, very creepy, you know, and, and it, it, you know, it can be, but you know, when we, you understand it. So like what Katie was saying about that emotional connection, having an emotional connection with these sort of abstract ideas, um, mm -hmm. it, it's really, really very useful for that, especially in, in helping students understand the Christian mystery and, and a lot of other Christian ideas. But, um, you know, I've even, um, and, and like Katie said about, um, uh, Zamyatin's uh, novel, We, helping to get the kind of the zeitgeist of that of that era and kind of get that experiential um, feel for it. I have used Rogue One, especially the scenes on Jeddah, yes. to set the stage for teaching the Gospel of Mark, because it's a hmm. very similar contextual um, setting, you know, where you've got this area that used to be and it still is to many people a very sacred place but it's yeah. under occupation by an imperial power and it's and it's being desecrated day and night and these people these remnants of this 
ancient way of life are are still trying to keep it alive in this you know very subversive way um and it's it's about to pop you know it's about to blow this whole place is about to blow and and uh, and that's just what the gospel of mark is when you wander into the story world of the gospel of mark so my students are like what is she doing i'm like i'm doing something smart you pay attention you know so they're like well i like this movie so it's cool it's cool so i've used that that way but you know what the gift of star wars it just keeps on giving for uh, a teacher of world religion such as myself because yeah of course <laughs> i mean you know you look at a, a room full of students who are almost all from the not not all but almost all from the abrahamic traditions mm -hmm. of you know judaism christianity and islam and i i do have a lot of students from all three of those um traditions but you're looking at them and you're trying to explain to them what an impersonal god is mm -hmm. and they're just like glassy-eyed you know they have yeah. absolutely no idea how to understand this concept but then you bring in the force and they're like, oh, okay, all right, I get that. It's still important. It's still essential to people's lives, um, but but they, you know, it's not somebody that you talk to. It's not somebody who's riding in the car with you. Jesus, take the wheel, sort of. Jeep. You know, I mean, it's not. <laughs> it's not like that, right? So they have this frame of reference. Um, you know, there's a lot of concepts about Hinduism and uh, Hinduism and Buddhism, but especially Hinduism, because, you know, Buddhism is rooted in Hinduism. Mm -hmm. And so um, a lot of that really helps me in the classroom. Um, I've used, I play the scene, uh, the Dagobah scene with L Luke and Yoda when he's talking about, you know, um, luminous beings are, are not this crude matter, right? And so yes. that's such a important part of um, of Hinduism and the Hindu um, concept of the non material reality of existence. Um, you know, Stranger Things actually all, also helps with that because in Hinduism, there's this understanding of the, the material realm is really quite a dangerous place, and that you have to learn to use the material realm in service of the spiritual and and mm. stranger things kind of helps with that because it's a bit of an extreme iteration of it but you know but <laughs> the upside down is but. a really extreme you know dangerous place that they have to learn to navigate in the, yeah. in a way that serves the other realm you know um and that manipulates things so um the dark side of the force i have i have used uh, the concept of the dark side of the force because it makes no sense to to people from an abrahamic tradition it's like there's no yeah. dark side of god you're lying you know mm -hmm. so right. but but people who you know in hinduism it's this idea that if nature mm -hmm. itself is non-dual you know mm -hmm. and good and evil are non-dual as well and one can be so subsumed in the the light of god that one becomes blind you know and mm -hmm. and so that has a dark side in it in and of itself you have, obviously blindness is is a darkening of the senses yeah. you know and so it's it's a real it's these are really hard abstractions to deal with in the classroom but when you can root them in you know these pop culture properties that everybody has become immersed in or at least some people i mean i always recognize the fact that not everybody's into this stuff you know right. <laughs> but but i always say if you can bear with us for just a second and and you know i mean i'm sure some people will go to them and then say oh okay i get that now i get that now you know that that's an interesting connection with what we learned in class and so um yeah so there's there's just a million little passing ways i've never taught a course on on any of these wonderful things that i love uh harry potter and star wars and star trek but um but i i would love to someday but but i do like katie said i, I do a lot of passing illusions that really help to reinforce concepts Right. It sounds like a really great way to make these abstract concepts and very, very traditional concepts that are difficult to apply to a real, our current day to day, very concrete. Um, like you said, um, I, I mean, where were you when I was in Catholic school? I will never read the Gospel of Mark the same way again. <laughs> oh, it's the best one. I love it. I love it. It's so good. Speaking of page turners. <laughs> Speaking of page turners. Exactly. Just read the Bible. It'd be great. <laughs> so uh, that kind of brings me, well, that answered that that um, that question. So what are some of the results that you see in your classrooms? Um, what connections have your students made with the subject material and the fantasy texts? Um, so Katie, you talked about we, you talked about totalitarianism. Um, can, you, can you speak to some some things that your students might have noticed or that or they told you about what you brought? Um, with the subject material and the fantasy texts in your class? Right. Well, one of the things that I think that they find that I, I find 
So it's a little funny, really. But I think a lot of times I, it was freshman seminar on Harry Potter that I taught. And they really think that this is just somebody writing down something fun on a piece of paper. And they can't believe it when you're able to show these connections and that, and you know, that's not an accident, that connection, (laughs) these things are deliberate and she's smart enough to come up with these things. And it's not just, it's not just fun and games and it's whatever you want to make of it, but there, there are real connections and meanings within it. And when they realize that they get a profound respect for literature that I think they don't necessarily come in with from high school. And especially when it's this kind of a text that is just popular and, you know, it's not Shakespeare, it's not Chaucer, and it is something maybe they can connect with as fun. But then to say, oh, it's fun and you can read Nietzsche in it (laughs) and it helps to explain the media universe that we're saturated with right now. Uh, You know, and I think that in itself, I... I think is wonderful, a wonderful, you know, evolution to be able to, to realize, oh, you know, people are, are really careful in their craft when they do these things. And then maybe when I write something, maybe I can be careful in my craft as well. You know, Um, I did want to also mention, uh, and this wasn't one of my students, but this is my son who devoured the Harry Potter books in one summer. And then we had the election of 2016. (laughs) He says to me one day, he says, you know, and my kids were grappling with, you know, things that were happening and they were seeing on the news. And, um, and my son just says to me one day, he says, I feel like we're living in book five of Harry Potter. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And I was like, so he was able to make that leap to write what I'm feeling feels familiar. And, oh, it's like I read about it. And having read about something like that, you you have a sense of it helps you to process it. And my response was, you know, Dumbledore's army still recruiting. Yes. You know, we know, we know <laughs> when you yes. know what the story is, you can plug yourself into the part that you want to play in order to be on, you know, doing something good in that story. And I definitely think human beings are, we are people of story. Like that's what we're creatures of story. That's what defines our our humanity in an important way. And being able to find yourself in a story that then helps you give meaning to whatever you're living through. I just think that's really powerful. Uh, And I definitely think fantasy and um, fantasy and sci-fi literature is just exceptionally good at that. What, what was it that uh, Ellie Vassell said? He said, uh, God made humanity because he loves stories. <laughs> you know, It's true. We, we're, yeah. we're very much people of stories. I, I would echo everything that Katie said. Um, I would also say my answer here is kind of lame because when you teach in nursing college, you do have to stick to the topic. <laughs> so I don't get a whole lot of, you know, I don't get to assign essays about, you know, the connections between these things, you know, they have to write about the, the, the fruits of their learning in the clinical setting, you know? Um, so I don't get a whole lot of that, but I will, I will say perhaps narcissistically that this has resulted in me getting a lot of really great gifts for my students. (laughs) So long ago, I got a gift, you know, so this is before there was a whole lot of Harry Potter merchandise. Yeah, remember those days? Remember the old days when like you had Mm -hmm. to kind of imagine stuff like was part of the Harry Potter. So -hmm. they got me this, this thermos that would, it was very dark. It had a dark, colorful, but dark pattern on it. But when you put hot liquid in it, then it kind of lightened up and became this very vibrant color. And they said that it just, it was a group gift. And they were like, we picked it out for you because it just seemed really magical. And it seemed like something. And then later a friend of mine got me the Marauder's Map version of the same thing. It's a mug and like, it's dark. But then when you pour hot liquid in it, the Marauder's Map appears, which is yeah, really exciting. So, that is. so really cool stuff. I ha- I've had a student um, crocheted me a golden snitch, which was lovely. Whoa. I had a student give me a um, something that he had made. He was an RA and he had made it for his hall, but it was like a, a 
framed colorful thing of all the Hogwarts houses. And it was really cool. And he gave it to me. And I'm like, this is so awesome. It's just, you know, so Emily, I get gifts. That's, that's my thing. Yeah. <laughs> you're you know. reminding me that I got this amazing gift from a student who, you know, and I don't exactly know what inspired her to do this, but she took all the punctuation of each of the books and made them into des- in the order that they came in. And she made them into design <laughs> in the order and it, what an interesting idea. It was yeah. just fascinating. You could see all the talky parts of the books with the quotation marks everywhere. And uh, and it was huh. just, you know, it was boiling them down to their punctuation. And it's so, it's so it's fascinating. Almost alchemical. And it was, it, yeah. and it was artistic as well. Like it was, it was beautiful. It's beautiful. So, I and I love wow. having it. I'm getting some serious digital humanities vibes from that too. <laughs> yes. Wow. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's true. For sure. Very digital humanities. Oh, that's so cool. Love it. I I love it when um, at the end of every book club that I do, I always tell my students, give me some kind of creative project that shows me what you learned from the book, whether it's Hmm. like, whether it's um, something you liked in the story, something you found problematic, something that you would want to change or something that you really enjoyed. I've gotten um, cross stitch bookmarks of Hobbit holes. I've gotten... um, little claymation um, characters from uh, from The Hobbit. I had, when I taught the, uh, the, the Lord of the Rings, all three, all three novels, this pair of students made Lego stop motion five minute videos of oh my gosh. each of the three books. Oh, I love it. They, their parents told me like, no, our kids are, have never spent so long on a project. They are spending hours <laughs> on Yeah, this. stop motion is no, that's not a quick project. No. But it's play too. They're having it's fun. That's play. right. Yeah. Yes, it was play and it was fun. And they picked out the things that like they noticed from the text and that they saw was important. And oh, I love that. I love that so much that, that, that your students clearly saw something in this magic that spoke not only to you guys as teachers, but spoke to them as students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that actually brings me to my fourth question, which is, in your opinion, what is the value of fantasy? Like, why even bring it into the classroom, Um, especially in college, like in higher education? Most people see college as the place to get a degree in a very Dursley-ish way, like getting the skills for employment, like getting those skills that will get you a job. So what would or what do you say to people who might ask you, well, how is Harry Potter or how is Star Wars going to get me a job? Right. So one of the my, one of my big pet peeves is this division of, you know, different fields into hard and soft. And like somehow what I do in history is categorizes soft like it's not valuable. And I'm a big proponent of the liberal arts because. I believe truly it's the most practical form of education. I think a lot of students come in, especially in this current climate in the generation, you know how expensive college is and they're fixated on the money and this concept of a job, which people asking you, what, what are you going to be when you grow up from the time you can first talk? And what I think is really hard to know when you're 18 is that (laughs) Your life is going to be more than your job, unless you're very unlucky, (laughs) right? Life is more than a job. Thank goodness. I think those of us who have jobs are like, oh, my God, it's not just, that's not all the only thing I've got to live for. And if you're going to have a life, you can't just have career preparation for that. And also, I think people don't think about this with history uh, because of the way they learn history a lot in schools, especially like K through 12, although there's some excellent teachers who are really doing a great, a great job, but there are a lot of people who are teaching history who don't, who don't really love it. And it can be very dry and boring. When, when I tell people I teach history, I either get, oh, I love history or I always hated history in school. It was so boring and just depends. I think a lot on your teacher And what that is, is again, it's Dursley-ish. They've taken all the imagination out of history and they've made you think it's just dry utilitarian facts. And you do have to try to know what's happening in history, 
But what's really important is the imagination that it takes to imagine what the past was like and to forge a kind of connection across time so that you can empathize with people who lived in really different situations than you, but are nevertheless human, pretty much exactly just like you. (laughs) So it's so important to be able to exercise those imagination muscles. And fantasy is just really wonderful at doing that in a way that it doesn't, you know, it's like, it's like swimming is exercise. You get a lot of exercise in swimming, but it doesn't, you're not sweating, you know, you don't feel it. And I feel like that's, that's how it is with fantasy. And then, you know, and then you're, you're in shape to apply that imagination in other ways. And, you know, it's not just about like understanding the past, although I think we're living in a time when it's just never been more obvious that we need to understand our history and understand it in a very deep, deep, rich way, just to be able to vote, you know, just to be able to know like what, what we think about like vaccinating our kids or whatever, right. You got it. You got to have a sense of, of, uh, you know, what's happened in the past, but also like, if you're going to figure out how to build a better world in the future, I mean, I hope that's what college graduates are planning to do, not just bring home a paycheck, but let's make a better world. That's really what it's all about. And if you're going to do that, you have to be able to imagine it. Well said, Katie. Well said. Yeah. Yeah. Amen to all that. I was, when you were talking, I was um, thinking of the Doomsday Book by Connie Willis. Yes. uh, I love that. An amazing science fiction book that really uh, puts in, puts in a, in a a really wonderful story context, very page journey, um, this attempt to make a personal connection with history um they take it to extreme levels uh with with time travel very dangerous time travel um so so yeah Yeah, yeah, so so emily did you know that i just published an essay on that no (gasps) i feel like you mentioned the book to me and that's why i read it yeah but i did not know that that, right oh you never you never followed up with me about it I made Amy Sturgis read it also. Oh my gosh. Oh, I would have loved it. Can you send it to me? I was like, Amy. If if anyone knows how to connect history and fantasy and fandom, it's it's Amy Sturgis. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. And she would give me, she gave me the sparrow. And I was like, (sighs) I forgive you for giving me the sparrow because I still have not recovered (laughs) from that book. But that book is really about the Columbian exchange, right? Yeah. Uh, the sparrow. And Mm -hmm. so I mean, I felt like I got, I got something out of that that i had not really gotten from the history part right but i could then apply it to the history Mm -hmm, but then mm -hmm. but then i gave her doomsday book and like i had stayed up all night trying to finish it as you say it's it's a page turner but uh, she has a whole series of time traveling historians and that's how they do their research as they time travel and it's so um it's so evocative, and I, I've written two essays now about them that, that are published, um, and one talks about, about it as dark tourism, that it's sort of like she goes to these disasters in the past, Oh yeah. so that, you know, you can be a witness, and it's actually, you know, in terms of, you know, the religious themes, I think that you would really pick up on, Emily, the yeah. idea of witnessing past suffering as an important way to raise the dignity of people who have suffered. I mm-hmm. just thought it's so, so profoundly moving. Um, and then uh, my most recent one was talking about the, the idea of the the ethics of being a historian hmm. and how she's exploring mm-hmm. the, the kind of idea of like, what does it really take to be a historian? And it's not the facts because those are just put in a, like a little microchip you know, but it's actually like living in the uncertainty of your present moment. Yeah. And she really, she really drives that home. Now I did also assign that. I totally forgot this until you brought it up. I taught a historical fiction class team taught with somebody in the English department. And oh, that was fun. That was Mm -hmm. super fun class, Mm -hmm. but I did make them read the doomsday book, which is not a short book. (laughs) No, it's very long. I know that would would be prohibitively long in a lot of courses, but yeah. Yeah. And the students were like, but, um, (laughs) but it's so good. And, you know, and we were able to talk about the plague and like, here's, here's what we know about historically. And then what's the value of putting 
it in the fictional context. And, you know, we did other things like we read a man for all seasons and mm. we actually, um, uh, I mean, we just did it. And then the students pick their own uh, work of historical fiction to, to write about. And I was supposed to give the history part and my colleague gave the English part. We like to argue with each other. And so it was fun for us. <laughs> <laughs> Point counterpoint. I didn't always love his books and he didn't always love my books. And so it's kind of fun, you know, show them, you know, what's what the two di different disciplines get get out of the, you know, out of the different um, the different texts. And and uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's that's a great example, Emily. I'm so glad you brought that up. I can say my here. pitch. There's actually a there's a book. The book that my uh, most recent one is in is called Doomsday Every Day. Oh, the science fiction of Connie Willis by oh. uh, Routledge. Okay. Just out in okay. October. Oh, I would like, and would, um, yeah. the whole book is great. Great. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. So this is, I'll, this is I'll include that in the show notes for sure. My, yeah, yeah. It's going on my reading list. <laughs> um, and I don't know if either of you agree with me back to this question of, you know, why do this? How why is this going to help us get a job? You know, how mm -hmm. is this? I do sense a real shift in maybe when they enter college, they're very focused on getting a job. And, and I, I have to say my students, you would think that my students would be sort of being future healthcare professionals, um, many of whom already have a degree and are going back to get this other degree. Um, you would think that they would be the most focused on a career and earning and things like that. But I find that they are more and more aware every semester that they have to have something that feeds them outside of this. Maybe it's the pandemic, um, mm. but but they are coming to this awareness that life is not all about what you do for money. And I see this also in, I have, um, I'm old enough to have adult nieces and nephews now, and they are, yeah, I know they're like lawyers and teachers and military people and nurses and things like that. So it's kind of crazy, but I'm definitely seeing in them the desire to have something about their life that feeds them in a different way than their career. Um, even when their career is very, you know, something that really drives them with a passion. Um, and so I find that really inspiring. And I think, I think a lot of people do understand that if you're not at least taking some time out to maybe enjoy nature or, um, maybe kind of uh, participate in some sort of communal experience of some sort of transcendence, whether it's religion or whether it's experiencing, you know, Marvel movies or a Star Wars movies or Star Trek or something where you can experience it with other people and feel that sense of transcendence with it. Um, you know, that that life is just less meaningful if you don't have that. Uh, maybe it's a, a really meaningful um, community volunteering activity that you participate in, you know, maybe it's some combination of all those things, you know, um, and, but I do, I do, I, it gives me a lot of hope to see that there ha there does seem to be a shift in in younger people these days who who seem to want all of it, you know, and seem to want to have that life outside of work. Um, and so I think that these, these fantasy and science fiction um, properties that we love are only just going to get bigger and bigger and more mainstream because they do give people a little slice of that transcendence that they're longing for. You know, I show this movie in one of my, it was in the Harry Potter and liberal arts class. I started with, I know the students were like, what, what are we doing? Uh, and it's a movie. I don't even but it's a Tom Hanks, Meg Ryan movie, the, the one of the lesser known ones, Joe versus the volcano. And it has a real weird, you know, it's got a little weird mm, colonizing eh, kind of not great part of it. But <laughs> it starts with him. He's crushed by his job. You know, it's like this is like, you know, this is a man who has nothing but a horrible job. Yeah. And then when he gets this diagnosis, a brain cloud, and he's told like that, you know, <laughs> he's given this opportunity to live it up before he throws himself into a volcano. It's really liberating. And, um, you know, what I, I sort of so he goes, I love the scene where he goes and he's shopping for his trip and he goes to this like a like a fancy 
you know, costumer, like some somebody who's, in, but they've got all the things at the store and they say, you're going to need this. And it's a giant suitcase. And he just starts, yeah, I'll put this in the suitcase and yeah, I'll do this. And he doesn't know what he, why he, why, he's just drawn to, and I don't remember all the things he's drawn to the little globe and he's drawn to the, this, and he's drawn to the, you know, to the little golf set. And then what happens, like I'm spoiling it, but like uh, it's a long, it's an old movie from the eighties or something. Uh, he, he gets um, like uh, shipwrecked and his suitcase pops up beside him and he's able to use it as a raft. And then of course it has all that stuff in it. And so when he's bored, he plays golf and it has, you know, stuff for him to drink in the little mini bar that he put in there. And I feel like this is a metaphor for that, you know? That you, and a you nice say, preview to Castaway as well. I was going to say, this sounds familiar. <laughs> There's no volleyball. Ah, no, no, no. But, um, you know, but I sort of feel like it's this, you know, you in, 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 in like he ends the movie also like floating on the suitcase. And I guess the Meg Ryan character says something like, you know, what's next? And he says, well, I don't, something like this. I don't really know, but I do know this. Wherever we go, we're taking this suitcase with us. <laughs> and I feel like, like, that's your education <laughs> because you don't know where you're going. And what you need is this little, this little collection of things that you are interested in and you love. And maybe you don't even necessarily know it, but that's going to buoy you through all the different you know, um, storms of your life. And I do think, I agree with you, Emily, that I think that there are a lot of people who are yearning, who are hungry for something that has meaning. And these are great ways to, to connect with that. And if it weren't for pop culture, would you even be able to make that metaphor? Right. So there you go. Yeah. And a lot of these students have not seen that movie, but they know who Tom Hanks is. All right. <laughs> You know. you know why I'm laughing about Joe versus the volcano is because <clears throat> on the Purdue Owl website, which is where you go to get your your, your citation, citations or yep. any citation style, they've got a complete right, rundown do. of all the different citation styles and um, their example for how to cite a film in Chicago style is Joe versus the volcano. Yay! <laughs> so I have stared at that citation so many times in the last year and a half. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that so when you edit Emily. books on Star Wars, Star Trek, and Harry Potter. <laughs> yes, uh, yes. I, I always tell any student like, don't bother buying the MLA book or or any other citation book because it'll be outdated before you graduate. So before it ends up book. on your porch, <laughs> exactly. It just oh, it's insanity how quickly they update, and then you have to buy another. No, just use use the website. Use the website. It's fine. Anyway. And it's it's just a signs of the times. I mean, that's how fast information is changing and and updating. And you know, if we have to have now, ways to I accommodate will tell it. you this: historians use Chicago, and therefore Chicago doesn't change that much. <laughs> <laughs> so do religious historians studies. are like, we don't need that. We don't need to cite a website. Let's wait twenty years until we're sure this is going to stick around before we devise a way to cite a website. <laughs> I'm exaggerating. Anybody who loves Chicago but, out there. Only a little. But a little. MLA is like, let's let's not have a comma there and we'll re reprint this whole book. Oh, now it's a year later. Let's put that comma back in. Oh, you know that thing we had at the end? Let's Save put it in the middle. Save your money, kids. Save <sighs> your money. MLA. Right. Especially, especially if you have to buy a science textbook. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Really. Anyway, we digress. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. But no, I'm not. I'm not sorry at all. <laughs> okay, now let's chat about Potterversity. So you two have been hosting Potterversity, a Potter Studies podcast for a few years now. Can you tell us how that came about how, and how you two got started? Right. Okay, so I was hosting another podcast called Reading, Writing, Rolling, and I was looking for somebody who would be, you know, like a, a every now and again um co-host with me and uh because i normally would have like as a special guest john granger 
And he was uh, sort of transitioning out of Harry Potter stuff a little bit, I think. And and so um, he actually recommended Emily. And we had we had done a podcast together about Star Wars and Harry Potter. That was a lot of fun. And Emily was game. And then I was. We, we I didn't cha- have to we, shout in the gym anymore. Shout <laughs> into a right. microphone. You're not just shouting right at whatever anybody's saying as you listen to our podcast, but you actually get your own microphone. And uh, yeah. And so then we, we uh, like rebranded the, the podcast a few years ago and uh, we renamed it and it's all me and Emily now. And, uh, and that's really how it got started. And I, I guess I was sharing with you, before we started, at least that I am not somebody who ever thought I would do a podcast. As it even sounds funny to me saying it now, <laughs> I've, done a lot of, I've done a lot of episodes of podcasts now, but uh, it has been so much fun, and it gives you an excuse to talk to wonderful and fascinating people about the subjects you're most excited about. It keeps me you know, in the loop of the conversations that are going on about the things that I care most about. And like, it's just a, also a wonderful excuse to to talk with my friend, Emily. <laughs> so I really love it. I don't know, yeah. Emily, if you have a different origin story. <laughs> no, I don't. I knew you would nail it. So I'm, I'm glad you did. Um, I, the only thing I would add is that, you know, it's kind of a uh, there's a little bit of a legacy of continuity with um, the other MuggleNet academic focused podcasts that have come along. So it's really started right. with MuggleNet Academia, which mm-hmm. then um, a transition to reading, writing, rolling, which mm-hmm. then with, uh, you know, cast changes along the way. And then yeah, and, and then Emily, became... you were a you were I was a guest on MuggleNet Academia mm-hmm. and you were as well. I was too. Right? Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. And then um, and then right. And then eventually Potterversity. So we're kind of a um, not exactly an unbroken line, but it's it's kind of a yeah, there's a stream of continuity there. So and we're we're very proud of that mm-hmm. heritage with I feel like uh, this is an Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, and we're very grateful to MuggleNet for for being a great host for our podcast. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I feel like it's such a good example of taking a leap and saying yes. I just said yes to being on the MuggleNet podcast, and then I said yes to okay, I'll I'll host this other one, and just keeping to say yes and and growing all the time and even throwing myself into things that I had no confidence in. And I think uh, it's just been very rewarding. Agree. Same, same. Although I have to say, I, I could, I was like falling over myself to say yes. Cause I, <laughs> I had so much to say that <laughs> you know? I just, I wanted to be part of this so bad. And I, uh, so, but it's great because I, like Katie said, it, it keeps me, engaged where I might kind of become a little passive with it just because I have other things going on and other things, Mm -hmm. other demands on my time. And I might just kind of become a little bit passive about it and fall out of, out of the know with these things. Um, But it really does keep my head in the game. And I, I really am grateful for that. Awesome. Can you guys share some of your favorite insights and lessons that you've learned when engaging in Potter Studies, whether it's through the podcast itself or even through... Um, so for for those of you who may not know, listeners, um, every year Chestnut Hill College in uh, Philadelphia hosts the Chestnut Hill Harry Potter Conference. And that's kind of become, <laughs> we jokingly say, it's kind of your feeding ground for future hosts <laughs> or future guests and future hosts and topics. So uh, what are some of your favorite insights and lessons that you've gotten from um, Potterversity guests and from going to the Chestnut Hill Harry Potter Conference? There are just so many. Uh, it's it's hard to it's hard to think back and isolate some because they're just they're so important and they're so you know just these aha moments. Um, I, you know, I, I I can mention some, but again, I'll just be kind of grabbing them at random. Yeah. Um, uh, we just released an episode with John Anthony Dunn, and he talked about um, 
the Death Eaters and the concept of eating death in Harry Potter. And he's a he's a biblical scholar and a um, especially New Testament. And I just was my mind was just so opened up by his talk. And and he's given other talks that I felt exactly that way with. So I love I love when he opens his mouth. <laughs> you know, um, uh, I don't know. You know, Lauren Kamachi gave this talk on uh, physiognomy and the the way Rowling yes. describes faces and the way that that relates to kind of Victorian notions of physiognomy and the role that they play in people's personalities and their yeah. faults and criminality and things like and, that. And and, yeah, that's her. Ep- that's her essay and open at the close as well. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Christina Phillips Matson, I believe her name is she her essay in uh, open at the close is about nonsense in Harry Potter. And I mm-hmm. remember getting so much out of that talk and thinking about that in in days to come. Um, uh, Mark Anthony Lewis has given so many, um, you know, really great talks. And he's got a, a really great blog that um, he also writes about harry potter on his his blog post and we we ended up interviewing him on this about bullshit in harry potter i mean he's got a very (laughs) rhetorical definition of bullshit and uh it makes perfect sense and especially in the age of trump i found it to be a really interesting read and so we ended up talking with him about it on the show and and it was just really fascinating um in terms of how applying it to harry potter um, so those are, those are just a few from me. Um, I will also just give a shout out to Katie, not just because she's here, but her work with maps and mirrors and um, uh, really uh, colonialist mm. perspectives on Harry Potter have been very personally influential to me. So all that stuff. Well, thanks, Emily. I feel like I get a lot of, of the, you know, understanding of the religious themes and you, you work on so much of that, the numinous and so on. And, and that's, I think that's, that's an area where I know it's, I know those things are there, but actually having people come on and talk about that really helps me to, to pinpoint them. One of the kinds of Potter scholarship I like the best are the ones that actually show how the literature is you know, um, what JK Rowling is doing in Harry Potter is just like what, you know, just like that scene in Emma, (laughs) right. Or, you know, that it's, um, you know, that it's like, uh, Virgil's Aeneid and you've got these underworld journeys and that's really what Harry and you can see all the classical literature that's being reflected there. Um, and we've had Beatrice Groves on to talk about literary illusion and Harry Potter. And like that just is the gift that gives on, keeps on giving. <laughs> and she she talked about Dracula and yeah. the Bram Stoker's Dracula that you can see uh, like being referenced or at least played with in a different way. And I, I love I love those. They're like mashups in a way <laughs> that I that I really that I really respond to. You know, I also every now and again, we do we do kind of uh, look at intersections with other fantasy literature. We've done Lord of the Rings and um, some and also Star Wars. And I do I always find those really fun when, you know, you've got overlapping fandoms and uh, the kind of overlapping readings. And so I guess those are the things I like, but I, I don't know. I like so much of it. The psychology of Harry Potter, I find that really interesting. Yeah, all kinds of good stuff. It's Yeah, I agree with you, Emily. It's it's hard to pick. You know, um, I guess one of the things that I would say in general that I've gotten from doing the podcast is that when you have a good piece of literature, you don't run out of things to say about it. <laughs> you just don't. It's and the gift that keeps on giving. Yeah, yes. you've got new contemporary situations that make you think about it in a different way. We did an episode that was just about how people were dealing with COVID through Harry Potter, you know, uh, during COVID shutdown. Mm-hmm. And, you know, then... um you know, you've also got different people coming in with different questions about it. And especially as J.K. Rowling, has, you know, has said a lot of stuff, right? It makes you think differently about the author. Well, then that makes you go revisit the text and maybe bring 
bring a different perspective to what you think is going on in them. And I, I just really, I like the vitality of it. I just don't think I'm ever going to run out of things that are worth talking about in, in this, you know, this kind of fantasy literature. And that's exciting. It is. Yeah. And can we, like we, can we shout out um, Dr. Brent Satterley? Oh, and yes. There not only is, is Dr. Satterley a fantastic professor in uh, social, in um, I believe sociology, um, uh, social, social work, social mm-hmm. work, um, working with, uh, with LGBTQ plus uh, teens, but gives talks in, in drag as umbrage. I mean, where else are you going to get that? Right. And we have, okay. So we have a book coming out related to our podcast, Elise, where we invited some of our guests to contribute essays uh, to podcast. And Brent is one of the people who wrote an essay. uh, And he, then we had, we recorded podcasts with the people who wrote essays and so he, you know, he, he has an episode that will be coming out. <gasps> it'll be a, it'll be a bit yet. Cause the book has to come out first, Sure, uh, yeah. but it's wonderful. It's wonderful. He and Embalia Thomas, uh, who oh. is, she does a lot on Harry Potter and it's not just, I don't want to say it's pedagogy because it's a, like a deep empathy with both teachers and students Mm -hmm. that you can get when you are really reading deeply into the Harry Potter universe. And she's so fascinating. Um, And so the two of them, you know, kind of talked about teaching with Harry Potter, which is the theme we're talking about uh, today. And they, I think that people will really love uh, love that episode because just hearing them talk, it was like a balm to any teacher. (laughs) It was wonderful. Yes. Uh, I'm actually looking at like, I, I sometimes get emails from uh, academia.edu. Um, let's see, it's pers- narrative inquiry uh, and pedagogy, I think is how Mbalia Thomas uh, put it as um, as the study that, that she did in, because uh, like, that's something I'm trying to do, like, or, or at least yeah. making the attempt to do um, if I can. But yeah, to just, to, it's, I would, Oof, I love that episode um, on Potterversity with Mbalia Thomas. So like, this is kind of what I want to do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. <laughs> Mbalia Thomas, you may or may not have inspired this podcast. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure she would enjoy being reached out to as well. All right. Uh, by the time we record this episode, um, it's currently it's currently the end of February um, and Harry Potter Legacy has been released, which has led to an upsurge of you know, valid criticism towards the author and her transphobic comments, as well as some feedback from the queer community about those who might still engage with the Harry Potter universe. So how have Potterversity and Potter Studies in general responded to the author and how how can we as scholars continue to engage in Potter studies while rejecting the author's abhorrent views? This is a challenging question. You can see Emily and I are both like, you want to go? Know. You want to take this? Do you want to? Do you want to? Happy to defer. So <laughs> I'll, I'll, tell, I'll tell a history story, okay. which is June 2020. It's COVID times. I'm on the way to the family beach rental house. We were all supposed to meet, but nobody will leave their house except me and my family because we were desperate. I was just desperate to get out. (laughs) And they're like, we'll go. We'll just go. And on the way down, all the stuff that Rowling, right, she publishes that essay. And and I just, I, you know, and then she hasn't stopped since then. And I... I had for so much of that COVID, we'd already been in the COVID times for a few months. And I always talked about my Harry Potter refuge. It was this little escape hatch that I had. And all of a sudden, it was also fraught and difficult. There are, I think, I think things that are really difficult about it. It's obviously a complicated topic. And... I think there are a lot of people who are struggling 
with it. And I think JK Rowling is one of those people. And, um, and I also think that there has been a particularly strong reaction to JK Rowling because we expected better from her because of the stories she's told, which are actually very LGBTQ friendly. They really, they, and they were a, they were a home. They were a refuge for people who felt like they were the odd man out. There was something in the closet about them, right? There was something that was, that wasn't, you know, muggle about them. And they felt like this was honoring them in their uniqueness and they could see a place for themselves there. And then she comes out and says these things and it's betrayal because we thought she was, we thought she was different. And so I think there's just been a lot of vitriol toward her. And I've just myself, I'm just not about vitriol. Uh, I think people are complicated. They have their own journeys. I'm also, I try to, I'm not an expert on this. I'm just trying to keep my ears open and my mouth shut when, <laughs> when, when it's necessary to do that because it's important to listen to people. And when I listen to JK Rowling, right, let's understand where she's coming from. I just hear a lot of fear. I think that she's fearful and she's been reading some stuff that's fear mongering. It's not even correct. Her, you know, in that essay, all that's all the research she had, she quoted was actually a lot of bunk. And, um, and so I'm not interested in rejecting this wonderful world that was created that I think actually does it, it says the opposite of what she's saying. She should read her own stuff. <laughs> um, but I also think that we need to be aware that this was written by a human being. And I absolutely agree that bringing a critical perspective, even like a newly critical perspective to all the things that were maybe unintended, unconscious, um, maybe that we don't like are good. And I think, Emily, you know, you and I both decided that we, you know, obviously we're still in the Harry Potter fandom. Uh, and I'm not somebody who won't say the author's name. Um, but some people who are in the fandom, they don't want to talk about the author and they want to focus on the text, which I think is totally legitimate. Honestly, frankly, if people just want to go out of the fandom, you know, you do, do what you feel is necessary um, and right. And I think, Emily, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. I think our perspective is that we are open to what people are doing. We want to hear all the different vantage points. We want to hear the criticism. We want to hear the people who want to focus on the text. And I'm still interested in people who are, you know, who are talking about the author as well. I don't want her to dominate every conversation. And I'll just be honest. I don't want this issue to dominate everything about the books because I don't think that's really it's, I don't think it's the books. So that's me. Sorry. I went a long time on that. <laughs> Emily, were, chime in. <laughs> it was brilliant. We, I, we let you go because it was, it was very brilliant and it, it really represents my thinking as well. You know, I have the um, great fortune of being a lifelong practicing Catholic. And that means that I have a lot of practice in forgiving my institution. Oh. <laughs> so every day I get out of bed and I forgive my church and then I put my pants on and I go about my day and I forgive my church for all, for 2000 years of stuff I wasn't involved in. And I forgive it for things that I, that ways that I have been personally oppressed and marginalized by my own tradition. And so I have a lot of practice with this and I, you know, I'm grateful for it in many ways. Because whenever people challenge me and say, well, why don't you just quit? Why don't you go and be this church or that church? Um, I just say, well, you know, how is that going to help? How is that going to help make it right? So I'll stay here and I will try to work and make it right so that we can be the church that I know we should be. And so that's kind of the philosophy that I bring 
to this issue as well. Um, my my church was founded by um, St. Peter and St. Paul, neither of whom were really very perfect at all, you know, so, so it's, it's easy to look, especially St. Peter and say, oh my gosh, he was kind of the dopehead of the, of the disciples. You know, he was the one who was, he was out there with his faith, but he was also kind of a dope, you know, and making mistakes left and right. And so, you know, that I don't need to have that. I don't need to have perfection in that role of the creator. And I am somebody who also likes to focus on the text itself and really pull back in my language, even the way I write about the text. I like to pull back from mentioning her name, especially these days. And, um, you know, I'm not offended when other people do mention her name, but, but you know, I, um, I really like to focus on the text. And I know there's other ways of looking at it, too. And those are, those are interesting and valid and, and insightful as well. Um, so, so, yeah, so, but like Katie, I, I, totally agree that this issue just shouldn't take all the oxygen out of the room um, because there's so much to be said and there's so much insight and there's so many insights that directly counter what she has said in in her public with her public voice um and and i 100 percent agree that that you know the books themselves bear different fruit than what she's put out with her public voice and um and i'd like to explore those fruits i'd like to continue exploring those fruits um, even as a way of of counteracting um, some of the the harm that she's done and the damage that she's done, so just gonna keep on keeping on. Exactly. I mean, I think yeah. one of the things that I've really learned in the last few years, not only as as a teacher but also as a student, as someone in academia, is that criticism is so important. Like, it's important to teach students that you can still love a thing while finding issues with it. Like, I mean, like you said, but there's so many issues with the Catholic church, Emily. Um, there's, there are issues like, I mean, Harry Potter is not a perfect book. It is, there are, there are problems with it and there are, and it is okay to point out those problems. That's where yeah, look at all those of, LY adverbs. Yeah. Look Come at on. all the adverbs. <laughs> Come on. I mean, and one of the, you know, there are so many great talks from, from people at Chestnut Hill who are pointing out, um, you know, like the the consent problem that uh, that mm-hmm. happens in the in the books. There's the, um, I mean, there are there are satires out there. People of people saying that Harry Potter should have shared all of his wealth with with the Weasleys, but no, he just kept it in his vault for himself. Um, huh. You know, issues of you know anti semitism or issues of you know, there are no, fat phobia. What what mm-hmm. phobia? Fat phobia. Fat phobia. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And and well, and the heteronormativity and the heteronormativity yeah. and tokenism. Tokenism for sure. Yeah. And and but that does it take away and the and the, and is Harry Potter is not the only only series that is that has the has these issues. There are issues with with books all across history, all across like you know, there are issues with all kinds of stories that, you know, that that criticism helps us point out. And I think that's something I really do try to impart on my students in saying, you can point out the problems. And that's why we have my final creative project. If you think there's something that needs to be changed or there's something you didn't like about the story, process that out with your art. Criticism, criticism helps you point these things out. It helps you point these things out to yourself and to other readers, and it helps you analyze and think through it. But that doesn't mean you have to hate it. You don't have to put it aside. Like I will, I mean, there's there's fat phobia in The Hobbit. There's, um, it, these things do exist, but that doesn't mean I have to take Tolkien or, or, or Harry Potter or anything else out of my life. And I can also add new and more beautiful literature into my life as well that does fill in these gaps like okay i'm sick of the heteronormativity that occurs in harry potter let's read some more let's read some more lgbtq literature let's let's broaden our perspective and in both of your disciplines i think that's really important and that's really prevalent yeah in history we never think we've really gotten the truth we're always just getting a little closer and the way that we get closer is through debate Yes. We're, we constantly argue with each other as a way to get ourselves closer to what we think is a, you know, more, more and more truthful version of the past. You know, I was going to uh, mention to you just what you were saying, I think is, is exactly right. Like, I mean, I just feel like 
I, I think it's important to keep talking, to keep talking mm-hmm. and uh, not just not to shut down conversation or to say there are taboo things that we will not discuss. And uh, we saw at Chestnut Hill this year, a conference paper by actually one of my colleagues here at Marietta College, Ben Cromwell, that was about trans spite fic. So fat, uh, fan fiction that is spite fiction that is written to sort of directly like it's like I'll make a Harry Potter story that shows that I really despise what J.K. Rowling has been saying about trans people. Yeah, it's like take and, that fiction. Yeah, yeah. And it's I mean, and the hashtags, you know, are, are so wonderful. And there's been an explosion in trans positive Harry Potter fan fiction since June 2020 and that keeps going and it keeps accelerating because you have fans who now they're very intentional about, you know, I'm going to write a Tonks fan fiction that emphasizes the, you know, the metamorph magi, the kind of the ability of the person to transform into different people like that. There's that's a trans kind of idea or Mm -hmm. that you know imagines like what what would the trans dormitory be like at hogwarts and what would that you know how could trans people be accepted and that's sort of that's all kinds of different ways of of thinking about it and rewriting parts of the story so that you know harry is trans and 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 building on that and using the the things that you're disappointed about to generate something new that has a lot of vitality and that is like genuinely, you know, trying to to advance the conversation. I just really respect that in the fan fiction world. Absolutely. And I think that's, that's brilliant. And I love that fandom and the text and the author don't, you can separate, you know, the, uh, the author from, you know, you can separate the art from the artist. You can make it your own. And if, you know, if you feel that you can't, if you feel that, you know, they are inextricably linked, that that is another legitimate point of view. And agreed. It's all based on what one needs and how one can take care of themselves whether it's the Catholic church, whether it's, you know, whether it's rolling, whether it's HP Lovecraft, whatever it may be, there's, there are ways to keep to, as you said, Emily, keep on keeping on. Uh, On a lighter, lighter note, on a lighter note, um, as that was my, so actually, I actually want to ask one final like sillier question that uh, I'm going to kind of surprise you guys with a little bit. (laughs) He see if, um, See what you can think of. So out of the entire fantasy science fiction universe, this could be Harry Potter, it could be Star Wars, could be Star Trek, like whatever. Who would you want to be your teacher and why? Obi-Wan Kenobi because of awesomeness. (laughs) Of course you picked Obi-Wan Kenobi. (laughs) I may be slightly distracted in class, though. It's just a baby. Yes, yes. I think Yoda would be a hard teacher to have. I would not be interested. Like Yoda, he's tough. Yoda, Yoda's a tough cookie. Yeah. yeah. He does he not a lot give of out easy A's. A lot of problems with Yoda. A lot of problems. Easy. Actually, I should also say, really, the tag team of Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon Jinn. Yeah. Qui-Gon. So that, mm, that would yeah. be, I would like to sit next to Obi-Wan and listen to Qui-Gon Jinn. So. Yes. I'm having trouble a, with this one. Yeah. <laughs> I, I I would I know I kind of threw this at you, but I'm like hmm, lightning round. Mm, Cause see, I don't. Um, I mean, I like McGonagall. Mm. Do I want her? I homework? don't know. Right. <laughs> I liked homework when I was a kid. <laughs> oh, then McGonagall it's, maybe for you. It's Transfiguration maybe. homework. That's yeah. good stuff. That is pretty fun. Um, I always say uh, Lupin is my Harry Potter boyfriend. But like, I don't, I like, I want to be my boyfriend. In, you're not going to pay attention in, in Lubin's class though. You're, <laughs> right. you're going to want him to be my professor. the heart eyes and doodling in your notebook. On That's your right. No, no. I want, I want him to be my boyfriend, not my teacher. So, exactly. and I think Dumbledore, like, ah, oh, he makes some bad mistakes. 
as a teacher. But a lot of favoritism, a lot of favoritism there. Yeah. yeah so I'm leaving the, the children to their own devices. Experiential learning or really bad. <laughs> right. Teaching. Distracted <laughs> teaching. Distracted teaching. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. Uh, yeah. So I guess, I don't know. I don't really have a good one. Um, yeah. I mean, I was trying to think of, uh, you know, cause I, I use Star Trek sometimes in my, in my teaching as well. I didn't talk too much about that, but um, I was trying to think, is there even somebody, in, cause I like Jean-Luc Picard too, but I think like, I'm not sure he'd be a great t- teacher. <laughs> like who's a, who's a great little, teacher? A little distant. I don't know. Elise, yeah. what, what's, what do you think? Well, who's, for me, it's like the, the word teacher. It it and, and I mostly think about like who the mentor, like the Campbellian mentor yeah. figure. So it, I've talked about Gandalf in my blog, and you know he's mm-hmm. not necessarily a teacher, but he kind of has that mentor. And you know, I've, um, Emily, I don't know if you've read, but I did a, I did a post on a couple of posts actually on Obi Wan Kenobi on my blog. Yes, I will yes. have to check this out. Yes, you do. I think though, I. Would I like the game, the gamifying that Slughorn does? Like, I like that he kind of turns things into competitions. I mean, mm-hmm. he's not the greatest potions mm. teacher, and he does like I don't like the fact that you know he plays favorites and he collects students like you know somebody collects candy or of Harry Potter figurines. But I like the gamifying that he does. Mm-hmm. I think that's fun, and I like I I would I, I would probably pay attention in Lupin's class, but. <sighs> I don't know. It, it is a hard question. And that's what I wanted to you know, spring it on you a little bit because I'm mean. Um, but yeah, I'd probably pay the most attention in uh, in charms class, I think. I, li- I like Professor Flitwick. Um, I was going to say that too. I think charms would probably be a good class. Mm-hmm. Charms is, looks like a fun class and he lets you like, work with partners and do it on your own. Like he lets you, he lets you mm-hmm. practice to get in order to get it right. And that's, you know, that's something you have to do in a lot of things, whether it's practicing writing, whether it's practicing, um, trying to get that, um, that physics project liter- quite literally off the ground or whatever it might be. I like, I like how, and I like how nice Flitwick is like, he's a nice mm-hmm. teacher to the kids. Yeah. yeah, he is. You know yeah, who so, I think? So nobody's saying, nobody's saying professor Ben's no, no, nobody no. for the history teacher. Too I dead. Mean, <laughs> the, the, and I like history. History of magic sounds so exciting. Like that sounds like a really exciting subject, yeah. but it's, it's. And he's so terrible. Actually, my very first published Harry Potter paper was uh, Harry Potter and the Ghost Teacher. And it was a defense of the art of lecturing, believe it or not. Mm. No, I do believe it because my first, my first um, in-person attendance at Chestnut Hill, I, I, I knew oh. you had written that, that paper and Bins was actually one of my non-examples in my presentation. Yeah. I'm like, here's how Bins is doing my thing wrong. And I was like, yeah. sorry, Katie. No, he's a terrible teacher. <laughs> but what, but I guess my point was that uh, like, you can lecture really badly. But you can also do group discussion really badly. Yeah, yeah you can, that's you can true. do either really <laughs> badly, or you can do online learning really badly or really mm-hmm. well. Oh mm-hmm. yeah. Any, it's not the, it's not the thing. It's not the pedagogical like. It's not the method of teaching. Mm-hmm. It's how you do it. It's the execution. Mm-hmm. Yeah, as really they say true. on Project Runway all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Your execution. More pop culture is the references. Yes. Yeah. You know who I wonder, I think is going to be a really good teacher and I'd like to see her in action is Ray, Ray Skywalker. Yeah. I think oh, she'll be a great she teacher. She would be good. I, mm-hmm. I'm hoping that someday, someday that Grogu gets Ray for a teacher. Yeah. It's just a little hope of mine. Yeah. I think, I Luke, think she Luke, might get it. Luke tried. Luke was bad. He Luke just, was. Yeah. It's hard good. when you know it's not actually mark hamill in person it's lit <laughs> it's oh, a bot yeah it's it's a bot and yeah it's a, meh, but i mean luke, well, luke tried to but, luke tried to kill one of his students well yes we know <laughs> that, that he well. yeah that. there that's building a whole context for that kylo ren move and it's it's it, it was bad news for grogu yeah <laughs> good news for mando i guess you know yeah. he, he got his baby back so yeah you know. he did Oh my gosh, I have a student who's so excited. Like she's literally counting down the days to the Mandalorian season three. And I'm like, yeah. 
you are my child. Yes. Yep. I, yeah. I know. I'm so excited. Yeah. So exciting. Oh, all right. And so as we, as we close this particular episode, first, I, firstly, I want to say thank you both again so much for joining me. Um, before we close out, do either of you have any, you've mentioned a couple of publications and a couple of things you're, that you're working on, but is there anything that you want to shout out? Are there any projects that you want to say? Um, I'm hoping to release uh, this particular episode in like May, June. Is there anything you want to shout out now that you would like that you would like people to engage in that you think people should know about um, when it comes to your work uh, in in pop culture and fantasy studies? Um, I will shout out that um, I have an essay coming out in a, a volume called Beyond the Ivory Tower. Right. Did I get that right, Katie? Yes. And Harry Potter and Harry Potter Beyond the Ivory Tower and Harry Potter. Um, and that is on parenting, which is kind of an odd topic for me, but um, but there are some religious themes to be talked about too. And so that's coming out. And then Katie and I have been working hard on our Potterversity book um, and that we expect that to be out someday in the next, I don't know when, um, I don't know how long. Sometime this take. year, we hope. Sometime, I, I think, yeah, hopefully yeah. this year. Also um, this year, I hope that um, a, a volume that I edited along with Amy Sturgis will be coming out um, on Star Trek. And then either maybe late this year or early next, uh, we also co-edited together a volume on Star Wars. So really excited for all those things to see the light of day. Yes. And, you know, Emily and I both have essays in that um, Beyond the Ivory Tower and Harry Potter. Mine is about colonialism and looking at those Pottermore, now Wizarding World backstories as the kind of history of the Wizarding World and like the the unconscious colonialism that you get when you're reading those histories um so very good uh, stuff. so that was a fun one and then um we both have essays in the potterversity volume that will be coming out as well and um and i also sa said to emily like i might have a star wars idea i'm not really sure <laughs> and emily was like send me abstract send me abstract <laughs> yes 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 <laughs> and so i've got so i've got a star wars uh essay in the star wars volume that emily uh and amy sturgis are putting out later Yay. on that's on um harry potter and uh the the sequel the i don't know what you call the sequel, yes, trilogy, sequel trilogy the ones with yeah. ray the ones with ray and really making some really strong comparisons in the story arc and you know sort of their um their sense of themselves in relation to their past and their future destinies mm -hmm. uh, both ray and harry have some there's some amazing similarities there brilliant stuff thank you both so much for joining me today and well thank uh, you elise this yeah, was so much fun yeah. Listeners, thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Be sure to hit the subscribe button on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or your other favorite podcast feeds. If you enjoyed listening, please leave a rating and a review as well. You can read and find out more about Teaching with Magic by visiting our website, teachingwithmagic.blog. You can leave a message on our podcast page, read past Teaching with Magic posts, and check out our book lists on our affiliate page. We also invite you to support us on Patreon. You'll have access to bonus material, our Discord channel, live Q&As, and you'll get a sneak peek at future products such as lesson plans, worksheets, and other teaching tools. The link is always available in our show notes and the podcast page on our website. Thanks again for joining us, and as always, keep making magic.